to the Explaining History podcast. And today I'm going to talk uh, a little bit about the development of the Maoist regime uh, in 1949, uh, the, uh, what the, the beginnings of um, totalitarian control and the crackdown on dissent, and how the police state was quickly established. As we know, from 1945 to 1949, there had been four years of uh, a civil war that had been on hold throughout the period of the Second World War, um, well, China's Second World War, which lasts from 1937 to 1945, uh, and the victory on the battlefield of the communist forces uh, with some help from Soviet Russia uh, had seen Chiang Kai-shek flee uh, with the nationalists to Taiwan. So today we're reading from Frank Dakota's uh, The Tragedy of Liberation. It's the the first part in his uh, trilogy on Mao's China. Um, the first actually published volume was Mao's Great Famine. This came second, but chronologically it's the first one. Frank Dakota writes, All over China, the police visited people suspected of being sympathetic to the old regime. In big cities like Beijing, Shanghai and Wuhan, special teams trained to take over public security arrived within days of liberation. After briefing by underground members of the Communist Party, they moved into precinct stations and police headquarters and ordered everybody to stay at their posts. General Chen Yi, now the new mayor of Shanghai, replaced his peak cat with a dark beret, exhorting the police uh, force in a three-hour meeting, an unlit cigarette dangling from his mouth. They should reform themselves and at the same time carry on their work with their out undue anxieties, he explained. The communists had little choice but to ask former government servants and puppet policemen to stay on. In each department, the post office, the city hall, the police headquarters, some of the top officials of the old regime slipped away, and a few new faces appeared. These were the party cadres, charged with overseeing the takeover. So this seems to be a really pivotal moment in the establishment of the new regime um, of a, a party functionaries attaching themselves to the normal bureaucratic running of uh, everyday Chinese life. And at first saying that there's nothing very much to worry about, there'll be little change, there'll be mainly continuity, um, some of the more egregious aspects of um, nationalist rule and the kind of the hangovers from China's feudalism will have to be dealt with. But for most of you, it's really not going to be a big deal. Please don't worry. However, the Maoist regime, as it established itself, began to start to create some of the infrastructure of societal control. One eyewitness described um, the commissar um, class, the cadre class, um, that was emerging in towns and cities across China thusly. The typical bureaucrat of the regime, in his blue or khaki uniform, like a soldier's, topped by a cloth cap, which he often wears even in the office, resembles a Soviet commissar much more than a Chinese official. He lives frugally, he is a poor man, and is clothed, fed and housed by the party. His tobacco and his soap are given to him on the official ration and he hardly earns enough in a month to buy himself a pair of shoddy sandals. He sleeps on the floor and in a, a requisitioned European buildings. He rejects the soft mattresses that would prevent him from sleeping. He is distant with strangers, and apart from those few men who are appointed to deal with foreign relations, he is inaccessible. He insists that, others, uh, uh, that other Chinese speak to him in the Peking tongue, now more than ever the official language of the whole country and not in the local dialect of Shanghai or elsewhere. There are some really interesting uh, things to say about that extract. This idea that the, um, the cadre is poor, uh, that the cadre has to emulate these uh, values of kind of almost like a Marxist asceticism, that they don't have material belongings, they're, not, uh, they don't, they're sort of not attached to the world through materialism, in that way. Oh, actually, this isn't true, uh, and there were plenty of greedy and corrupt party cadres across China who ate very well during periods of famine, for example. Um, though for some, obviously, it, it would have been uh, the case. Um, 
there was the idea of, of sleeping on the floor. Um, it really has real echoes of the Russian Revolutionary Intelligentsia tradition of books like um, What is to be Done, which was Chernyevsky's uh, famous revolutionary novel uh, in which um, the hero hardens himself for the revolution. He doesn't have um, a private or a social life. He takes um, icy cold baths and sleeps on beds of nails to harden the body to become almost like a machine for the revolution. Um, and the attempt to present party cadres as just this, um, people who have no friends, who uh, is, are distant with strangers, um, that they are really just units of revolutionary change. But it was useful to um, the new Maoist regime that the nationalists had been building the infrastructure of uh, control um, from 1945 onwards. They had been uh, issuing identity cards um, to cities under their control and um, they had been bringing these and imposing these on households. So a household could mean um, a uh, traditional family but could also mean any collective unit such as a factory dormitory or a hospital department. And as with the Stalinist takeover of Eastern Europe, the ID card system, when it was uh, co-opted um, and appropriated by Mao, it begins to change because the ID card system becomes a way of controlling uh, rationing, controlling food. Um, Eastern Europe is uh, victim to Stalinism almost through the politics of hunger um, by the state controlling the food supply and the, Stalin the Maoists in China are a little different. Food ration cards would now be entrusted to the head of each household which could be a family head, a factory um, manager, uh, the uh, abbot in uh, a Buddhist temple um, and that would mean that the individual would be able to hand out food ration cards to everybody within the household but also those food ration cards could be withdrawn if there was any unreported change about that household so this made um, the heads of households um, very eager to inform the police about any details whatsoever. And it inculcated a culture of um, information sharing, of, inf of upward kind of information transit to the state. The state was able very quickly, using rationing, using food, to start to enter into the private realities of the home, of the workplace, and other sort of social uh, institutions and settings. This was also um, enormously bureaucratic. It took a, a huge amount of time, energy, effort and paperwork to do, but it gave the state um, the sort of control that Mao knew would be necessary in order to bring about his revolution. It is interesting to consider here in the 21st century um, the social algorithms being employed by uh, China under Xi Jinping, um, the kind of algorithmic control that Chinese people are soon going to be subjected to. Uh, and to look at the um, early days of the Maoist regime um, and see a kind of a, a interesting synergies there. The next level of classification of individuals was to give them a class label which would include the family background, occupation and individual status. And there were around 60 separate uh, class labels, which were divided into general class categories. Those were ranked as good, middle or bad on the basis of their uh, assumed loyalty towards the revolution. So, for example, good classes would include revolutionary cadres, revolutionary soldiers and revolutionary martyrs industrial workers and poor and lower middle peasants. Middle classes um, would include the petty bourgeoisie, the middle peasants, intellectuals and professionals. Bad classes would be the landlords, the rich peasants 
and capitalists. And very quickly, two designations would eventually be uh, created, um, black and red, or friend and foe. Um, to be assigned a, a black characteristic or a, a black label um, would shape one's life really until the end of the, uh, of the Maoist era, perhaps even, even beyond, as of course children inherited the class status of their parents, the class labels of their parents. Now last week I did a podcast on uh, the uh, unpeople or the former people of the Soviet Union under Stalin, the enemy classes who essentially are edited out of uh, public and social life, uh, who are disenfranchised, uh, and who are, are marginalised, and much of the the kind of the, the models for class persecution ha- are acquired uh, from um, Stalin uh, by Mao Zedong. The members of the bad classes who were arrested first uh, were heads of secret societies, uh, war criminals, um, those who uh, were um, leaders of the the old regime, um, and the. Nature of communism um, being what it is, the kind of the, the paranoiac uh, nature of communism looking for uh, class enemies wherever they might potentially be, meant that um, this sort of hunger for rooting out class enemies um, is um, transposed very quickly to the, the, the bad classes, um, the uh, capitalists, the landowners, uh, the former government officials, um, they they become uh, suspects as um, it's imagined that there are hidden enemies of the regime uh, throughout China. One of the reasons for this uh, continued uh, obsession with security, with internal enemies, with dissent, uh, and this overall paranoia was the fact that the war hadn't quite ended and the last parts of mainland China wouldn't be controlled by the communists until late 1950. Um, the nationalists were able to control most of China's territorial waters. The nationalists had a monopoly on Chinese naval power. Um, and they were able to use aircraft to uh, bomb uh, any sort of small boats uh, uh, along the coast of China, uh, small junks and sampans, um, which had been assembled for a, a kind of an improvised invasion of Taiwan. It was popularly believed that the nationalists in Taiwan would reinvade the mainland at some point in the near future. Um, the uh, nationalists used commando squads to carry out special operations raids, and they used aircraft to drop arms supplies, food and ammunition to um, guerrilla groups, um, not necessarily all nationalist guerrilla groups, uh, but those affiliated to them, uh, across China uh, in order to try to destabilise the regime before it had even had a chance to uh, establish itself. In order to control the cities, a curfew is declared. In Shanghai, cars were banned from the streets after 9 p.m., and pedestrians were banned after 11 p.m. Uh, sentries were placed along every street corner, uh, heavily armed, and newspapers um, and radio are co opted by the regime very quickly and were uh, used to publicize um, these terrible activities of the enemy uh, in order to bring about. Uh, a state of constant anxiety. Now, of course, the uh, there would be plenty of people within China who didn't feel anxious at the possibility of a uh, the fall of the Maoist regime and were very quickly began to invite it. But for a majority of people, even those who aren't supporters of the communists, what they do not want is a resumption of war. Um, the uh, general hope is that no matter what follows, and people could not have predicted what Maoism would be like, but no matter what follows, that, that at least there would be no more warfare. Um, a war in China, um, the Second World War and the Civil War that had 
kill between them perhaps 20 million um, around that kind of figure was um, such a, a kind of a, a profound scar, profound burden on the collective psyche of Chinese people that it made perfect sense that whatever Maoism represented, it was better than a return to war and there were plenty of people who were happy to compromise with the regime if that's what it meant. So this culture of vigilance was in a way part of the uh, desire by many ordinary Chinese people to not see uh, further conflict. But it's also uh, an indication as to what happens to a society when uh, a culture of denunciation, of uh, informing um, emerges. There are those who very quickly, um, if we look at the examples of Nazi Germany and Soviet Russia, uh, embrace the opportunity to uh, appear uh, loyal, to appear patriotic, to appear to be doing the, the right thing. The enemy was, uh, in the in popular perception, the enemy was uh, everywhere, was omnipresent. Um, the uh, common uh, slogan in Tianjin in 1949 was liberate the entire country and capture the people's enemy Chiang Kai-shek alive. Um, so there was an encouragement that people would write to the police, write to newspapers, and neighbours uh, begin to denounce one another, often in the anticipation that there'll be some kind of reward, or in a way of settling uh, age-old disputes and feuds, uh, which is often what occurs when you give people the powers of denunciation. They rarely uh, use them in a benign way. Um, the effect of this as well is that you get large numbers of people flocking to the Communist Party. Nobody wants to not be seen as a communist. Nobody wants their political origins and their class backgrounds to be questioned in any way. Now that um, rights are made conditional on class origin, the uh, power that the state has uh, becomes uh, deeply sort of psychological. Um, people no longer, the state does not have to justify itself to individuals. Individuals have to justify themselves to the state. Even individuals have to be good enough for the state to uh, avoid uh, frightening scrutiny. Uh, one foreign observer in Shanghai wrote, Everybody claimed to be a guerrilla, a soaking red partisan. And those, uh, again, who weren't able to claim this with any sincerity are visited by the police. They have their houses searched, their relationships with foreigners are questioned, um, they, the police are on the hunt for concealed documents or weapons, and uh, people who own things like radios are suddenly viewed as being highly suspicious. So initially, mass killing uh, doesn't begin um, in 1949. It is something that uh, emerges um, throughout the period 1949 to uh, 1958, the beginnings of um, the Great Leap Forward and, uh, and the Famine. But the um, uh, Maoism, rather like uh, Hitler's approach, uh, during his period of consolidation of power was to proceed carefully, gradually uh, and to bring about more radical change only when it could be guaranteed that the regime uh, was fully stable. That said, um, the scale of executions uh, initially um, and the, the, the numbers of imprisonments initially begins to significantly grow. Um, the most significant enemies of the regime were either uh, jailed uh, or were uh, shot. Some were registered and interrogated and kept under surveillance, knowing that there, there would be the opportunity to revisit these individuals uh, later on. In Shanghai, um, several hundred counter-revolutionaries the kinds of um, uh, the web of, inf of uh, intelligence uh, and support that the nationalists had had in Shanghai were rounded up uh, over the following months 
uh, and, and shot in droves um, by following December 1949 in Hebei province, um, away from the, the kind of the metropolitan centres, um, 20,000 suspects were executed in the first year of liberation. Um, and sewn uh, across the country in Hebei and in other parts of China, the killing rate would dramatically increase. It's interesting, again, one of these sort of synergies with Stalinism, the idea of doing it out of the way, of creating mass killing sites um, in remote places where they're not likely to be seen. Stalin was uh, always at pains to make sure that there was as limited public exposure to the gulag system uh, as possible for those that didn't actually wind up in the gulags. Of course, um, trains taking prisoners to the gulags would often travel through um, towns and cities late at night to, to prevent uh, there being any uh, questions about who was on board the, the, the train wagons. Uh, a middle tier of um, sus suspect people of people of suspect class origins uh, in 1949, managed really to go fairly un kind of ruffled by um, the revolution, um, by the the Mao seizure of power. Um, they exist in a kind of a sense of a place of, of false security. Um, professionals, the professors, bank clerks, lawyers, managers, doctors, engineers, um, were too important to the regime to um, to lose. Um, and also, these were individuals um, were going to be uh, important as Mao saw them to help build a socialist economy. Um, they, their treatment really is in trying to uh, bring change their thoughts, trying to bring about new ways of, of, of thinking. Um, they were sent to um, special uh, re-education schools to re-educate them in uh, Marxist, Leninist, Maoist thought, and in uh, government offices, factories, and workshops, schools, and universities, people were given um, pamphlets, literature, books to look through and to learn the new doctrine. Um, to some, it's, it's, it's a set of alien ideas they don't really understand, and they don't really and get why they're being forced to to think about them and for others um they have a, a already some level of um of grasp of, of marxist leninist and, and maoist thought um mainly it was a it was a, a case of learning the right slogans the right things to say in order to keep out of trouble and to keep the state off your back and here is where the term brainwashing actually first comes from this brainwashing is a Maoist term. Um, Frank Dakota writes, from Beijing to Guangzhou, cities became giant adult education centres. Banks, big shops and commercial offices had their own dedicated libraries. People were asked to transform themselves into what communists called new people. And here we've looked at this theme before as the, uh, the transformation uh, of individuals into new socialist citizens. Those who had questionable pasts, questionable class backgrounds, had to write confessions and admitted all their personal uh, faults, all their errors, all their mistakes. Um, and so here is the kind of the, the embryo of the, the struggle sessions that we've, we've looked at before. Sometimes these admissions would be enough. Sometimes they would be um, uh, evidence that the person had really taken on board the new values and was changing their ways. Um, some had to be called forth uh, for, for further interrogation uh, in front of audiences. Um, and this is, again, this is the beginnings of struggle sessions where they're forced to recount every aspect of their life, um, every bad thing they ever did for hours on end. And those who resisted could be worn down by... Uh, endless debate. Um, they would uh, be bombarded with uh, challenges by interrogators who would work uh, in teams throughout the night to force the person to uh, to crack through mental exhaustion. Um, so, and some uh, managers, um, academics who were guilty of having wrong thoughts would be made prisoners in their own workplace, locked in their offices, and visited by cadres and political instructors 
who would uh, eventually break them. Um, and every admission of guilt was, of course, added to a person's individual dossier, and their individual file, which would be uh, with them for the rest of their lives. OK, so that's just the very beginnings of talking about the establishment of the Maoist regime. Next time, we'll continue uh, and look at the way in which petty criminals were treated uh, during the Maoist takeover. Thanks very much, and I'll catch you on the next Explaining History podcast. Bye-bye.